Hi, I'm Marty Cooper. Uh, I introduced the first cell phone uh, about 47 years ago, uh, and I'm uh, proud to be here on the Waken Nation. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an extraordinary guest today, and it looks like from his background, he is uh, up on the International Space Station, Marty Cooper, uh, the inventor of the cell phone. Marty, welcome to the show. Uh, wonderful to be here, Brad. Sure. I'm going to uh, just read a little bit uh, about this. Uh, Marty Cooper, by the way, is the author of Cutting the Cord, The Cell Phone Has Transformed Humanity, an inventor of the cell phone. One of the driving forces, and I love this about your intro, this is what it says, one of the driving forces behind the creation of the cell phone was an FCC hearing, a hearing that was three months away. How important is a hard deadline like that to get you motivated for innovation? Uh, today's guest, Marty Cooper, understands that question quite well because he led the team that created one of the world's first cell phones at Motorola and made the first public phone call on it. I remember this. This was extraordinary. Uh, Marty also believes that the wireless revolution is still in its beginning stages that this technology promises to help end poverty and disease and bring education and employment to everyone. I agree on that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome engineer, inventor, entrepreneur, and futurist, Martin Cooper. <laughs> wow, that was an energetic beginning. You've done this before, I could tell. Maybe once or twice. <laughs> so let's go back in time. And uh, I got to tell you, you know, I was a kid and I grew up with Star Trek in the 60s and I'm sitting there going, I, I can't wait till we have starships and we have a flip communicator and everything. You were on the cutting edge of actually doing this. So let's go back at Motorola and you hear you got three months to create a cell phone. What was going through your head at that time? Well, the, the process is very simple. I you know, the first thing is to make sure the management supported me. It turns out I was really lucky in that regard because uh, Motorola was a fantastic company. It was the, it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to be proud to, to uh, start Motorola. Uh, I was there for some 29 years, uh, and uh, the management was supportive throughout my career. Uh, you, If you recall, uh, I know you read the book, the, uh, the, the most the powerful philosophy that I gathered out of Motorola was from the founder, who in fact tried to start Motorola a couple of times and failed. And right. his comment was, do not fear failure, reach out. Uh, and I did that uh, many times at Motorola and the management supported me. I had to pull together a team uh, and I had to persuade the team that they could do what every one of them thought was impossible. Uh, wow. and, and it turns out they came through. They, uh, we, uh, uh, I had to search throughout the company uh, for the technology that we put together. That first cell phone uh, had a, a number of things that had never been done before. And we put, had to put all those things together uh, in three months. Wow. You know, I, I hear this a lot when the corporate executives are kind of resisting change, resisting something, uh, it doesn't move along quite as smoothly, but you were given this parameter to just, okay, create. If you fail, you fail, but you're going to, at the end of the day, come up with something big. And they, they trusted that and they knew that. Well, that's right. I had had uh, failures in my career before then, but fortunately, most of my, of my efforts uh, ended up succeeding and uh, I built enough confidence. So they did that. But but the uh, the uh, head of the company then was Bob Galvin, who was the chairman, chairman right. of the board, and uh, he bet the company on this whole concept of uh, of uh, going up against the biggest company in the world, the Bell System, 
<laughs> it's happening in every regard. Uh, profits, sales, number of people. And Motorola, compared to them, was like a flea on, the, on an elephant. And he decided that we were right. The Bell system wanted cell phones to be car phones. Could you, yeah. could you imagine that, Brad? You know, we, we had been stuck in our homes, in our offices for 120 years with uh, those uh, copper wires. And now the Bell system wanted us to be stuck in our cars. We just didn't believe that was right. Uh, and uh, Bob Galvin and uh, his uh, key executives, John Mitchell and Bill Weiss, uh, all supported me going up against the Bell system uh, and uh, trying to persuade the world. We had to persuade the Congress and the uh, Federal Communications Commission that, uh, first of all, the time was ripe to have yeah. personal portable phones, not car phones, and the other thing is the Bell system wanted to have a monopoly. I don't know how you, <laughs> how you feel about monopolies, Brad. But the, oh, yeah. Yeah, we didn't agree with that. Neither do I. So you, basically what you're telling me is you're a radical. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, at that time, <laughs> today, uh, people don't care much for monopolies, as, as you know. Oh, no. Uh, nobody likes a monopoly. But what I find interesting is, and we see this, everywhere once a system is in place it is so hard to break it to break up the system to bring in new technology that is much more efficient and and can take us to other places uh, we can name dozens of in industries on our fingertips you know I, I look at the automotive industry sometimes and it's like I, we haven't really advanced that much in the past you know 50 years now tesla comes along and throws down the gauntlet. And believe it or not, Tesla is Nikolai Tesla's technology from, you know, back in the, the turn of the last century. So the innovation really breaks up these monopolies by bringing something new to the table that clearly the consumer wanted. Uh, am I right on that? Oh, you bet. You bet. Uh, the companies really, if they want to survive, they have to keep reinventing themselves. Really yeah. hard to do. You know, when you've got a bunch of shareholders that are uh, looking at your performance every day uh, and you take a risk, well, you know about risk. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the very word means that there's a possibility of failing. Uh, yes. And it's really hard to do. It is. Uh, yeah, I, I was part of the dot-com explosion back in the 90s and my little company just, you know, grew a hyper growth for like 425% for five straight years. Uh, and, and I couldn't believe what we were doing. And, and I want to get back to your story, which is innovation. Let's talk about innovation. You said this in the beginning of your intro. What did a deadline do when it came to innovation? Did it force you to get more creative? Did it force you to move faster? What did Tell us what that journey was like. Well, the, the real issue is if you're in a competitive business, uh, and uh, were we in a competitive business, we had uh, our major competitors were RCA and GE, <laughs> which were the largest companies in the world. Uh, we were, compared to them, we were pipsqueaks. Uh, but we had set a big enough share of the market, so we were forbidden to even talk about it because they were afraid the uh, uh, antitrust people in the government would come come after us. Yeah. So uh, the only way that you can maintain a position like that is to be paranoid. <laughs> you, you cannot be complacent. You, loose, you, yeah, loose lips sink ships. Yeah, well, as that's they say. right. You, that, that, you're exactly right. Secrecy was important, but also staying ahead of the other guys because they, they, if, if they got the jump on you, their resources were far greater than ours. So uh, that's really what uh, set the deadline. We had been battling with them for, uh, for four years. They announced that they were going to do this thing around 1968, 1969. And, and uh, uh, we took them on. And the key decision maker in this case was the FCC, Federal Communications Commission. Right. And we got the message indirectly that they were about to make a decision and there was no way we were going to accept whatever they said no matter we were going to influence it with every possible way 
And that's where I came up with this idea. The, the only way we're going to persuade them to do something as radical, because you used the right word, Brad, <laughs> as radical as a portable phone. And when the biggest company in the world says the time is ready to have car phones, the only way we're going to do that was to demonstrate it, show them what it means to have the freedom to be anywhere when you make a phone call. That sounds like an obvious thing to say now. At that time, you're right. That was a radical idea. Well, Tesla had this idea, and I'm not talking about the company. I'm talking about Nikolai. Tesla you know, wanted to grab energy and, and things out of the, the atmosphere, basically. And he knew how to tap into that. So here we have a generation of companies that were hooked up to the cable. You know, Bell Atlantic was one of them. AT&T did not want to give up those long distance. Remember, we used to have the booths, the phone booths on every street corner for years. They didn't want to give up those because they were making so much money from them. Now, if you see one of those uh, phone booths in New York City, you just stare at it like, what is that? And you really, the, a lot of young people today, they, they look at their smartphone and they think, that, well, this is the way it's always been. You were the pioneer who stood there and took a phone call or made a phone call right there to prove your point. What was that like? What was that feeling like? Because you know, we're talking about being radical and we're talking about innovation. What was that like? Well, I, one of the as, important aspects of the, uh, innovation is vision. Right. You really have to have a, a vision of the future. Uh, you mentioned that you were a science fiction fan. I was. <laughs> I, 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 spend, I, I tell people that the reason I know so much about the future is I spent so much of my life there. Because I, <laughs> as a kid, I was a dreamer. I always thought about what was going to happen in, in the long range future. And so I can only compare uh, the vision we had at Motorola with the Bell Systems vision, because they did a survey. They hired McKinsey, biggest consulting company in the world, to determine how many cell phones there would be in the future. Right. The answer McKinsey came with was the maximum number there will be in the world is about a million. <laughs> well, it turns out they were right. The maximum number of car phones that ever existed uh, in the world was about a million. Uh, as you know, there are now uh, uh, over 8 billion more, there are more cell phones than people uh, in the world. Uh, That's and, scary. Uh, more than two thirds of the people on the world have cell phones. Uh, there has never been a technology that has been so pervasive. It's amazing. Well, I think it was, was it 2016 or maybe it was sooner, like 2010? Um, communication between devices surpassed human beings <laughs> and it's growing exponentially. So like my refrigerator and my toaster are talking to each other and sending information to the grocery store. Um, and this, this communication, it's hard to believe that now our data is being uh, collected and shared and communication is happening from these devices that we have now. So this is the, this is, Amazing to me how this all started. Uh, well, brace just with the cell. Brace yourself, uh, uh, Brad, because it's only starting now. We're still in <laughs> early days. We're really, think about it, we're really just figuring out uh, in, in a societal way how cell phones work. How should they influence our lives? We still have problems. We right. still have people crossing the street watching their cell phones, depending upon uh, incompetent drivers uh, not hitting them. <laughs> uh, we still have problems of, of uh, kids being a little overzealous in, in uh, looking at the cell phones instead of dealing with other people. But we'll figure all those things out. Uh, and uh, we still have uh, problems of uh, there is not adequate coverage. Uh, right. you, you mentioned to me when we talked before about uh, uh, education. Well, mm -hmm. if, if the cell phone technology is important in education, Everybody's got to have access to cell phone technology. You can't have some kids having all the advantages of being able to access all the knowledge of the world and have another class of kids that either can't afford it or they live in areas where there's no coverage. You cannot have that schism. And we yeah, call yeah. that the digital divide. So there's oh, still yeah. a bunch of problems to be solved. 
but meanwhile, uh, I think we know what the potential is this, with the of the cell phone, and I did try to express that in my book. It's a fantastic book. I want everybody to pick up a copy. Uh, Cutting the Cord, The Cell Phone Has Transformed Humanity, published by Rosetta Books. Uh, pick up a copy, and it's also an audio book. So um, uh, if you're uh, on the go, get the audio book. Uh, yeah. You know, let's talk about this di- digital divide, because I talked about this in my book, Liquid Leadership. And uh, I was trying to let everybody know just how much technology was going to change us and how this new generation was actually changed by technology. Their brains don't work like ours because of video games and toys that talk to them and things like that. So uh, Nicholas Negroponte, uh, he put together a program called uh, One Laptop Per Child. And he went around the world and he started to realize this digital divide you were talking about, where there were people, let's say, kids in the middle of uh, Indonesia or some other country. Now, they have major cities in some of these uh, areas, but m- majority of the population is walking to school barefoot, uh, and their classroom is outside in a tree, uh, under a tree. And when they go home at night, they don't have electricity at their house. So he had a group of scientists and engineers put together a laptop that has a self crank on it to crank its own electricity. And these laptops are designed so that it's self teaching. You know, there's a lot of intuitive, uh, you know, learning from these uh, devices. And he also put on these panels on the side so that uh, they would have Wi Fi instant instantly. The second part of the digital divide that has uh, been interesting to me is there are kids in the inner cities. That when they go home at night, they don't have any of these products. They don't have a laptop. They don't have a cell phone because they simply can't afford it. So what do we do to bring this together, uh, Marty? Because this, this truly is. These are the tools of the 21st century. And if you aren't proficient with them in the usage of them, you can be falling behind uh, in life. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Well, I'm with you uh, 100%. And in fact, that is what my passion is now that that's what I'm putting most of my time into, uh, is approaching this digital divide, uh, because the technology exists, so we could educate all of our children in the cities where people today can't afford it, in the country where there's no coverage. The technology exists to fix that, right? And and why don't we have it now? Uh, I'm trying to persuade the FCC that if they manage. The radio spectrum, you know, the world of the radio channels that this, mm-hmm. uh, and, and they do, uh, uh, they encourage the technology to be uh, adopted that we could serve everybody. But in order to do that, you can't have a single technology doing everything. That's one of the uh, rules that I've had in my book, uh, which says uh, that if you try to create a technology that does all things for all people, it won't do any of them optimally. And so today, <laughs> we true. have something called the 5G. You've probably heard of 5G. Yes, I have. And, and uh, 5G has been very heavily promoted as being the solution to everything. Well, the, the purpose of 5G is what's called the Internet of Things. And you mentioned yeah. before that there are more yeah. communications between things than they are between people. But wait a second, Brad, the, the, the purpose of technology is to apply science to make products and services that make people's lives better. And if you don't make people's lives better, it's not, it's just curiosity. It doesn't have yeah. a purpose. So we got to, we, we uh, haven't finished the Internet of People, and uh, <laughs> our carriers are working on the Internet of Things. I, I object to that. There are I, this technology available that will allow you to serve people in, in farm areas, in, in rural areas, for five or ten dollars a month, not sixty to a hundred dollars a month, which is what it costs uh, today to give to give people uh, broadband access. Somebody has got to encourage private industry, people like yourself, to get out there and, and provide these systems, make money at it. But provide to, uh, the service at prices that people can afford, and to cover areas that the big carriers don't bother with. 
they're all focused on where the dense populations are. Yeah, it's true. There was a documentary on, uh, I forget which channel it was on. It was on one of the, you know, the PBS maybe. And they were talking about this one town. Uh, I forget where it was, but they had been calling every cable provider in the surrounding areas and they just didn't see the value of coming in and running cable uh, or internet or all these other certain ubiquitous services at the time. So the town council decided to create their own company that would provide these services for the people. Well, as soon as the other cable providers and the internet service providers heard this, they go, Oh, oh, oh you, you can't do this. So they start running in and trying to now fix the, the, the problem, give the solution when you know, people kept asking for it a hundred times. Uh, you and I have a, a little similar background. My, uh, my grandparents were from Hungary on my dad's side. So they came here to the United States in the early 20s after communism came to Hungary. And so my grandfather set up uh, there in Lancaster County, Lebanon, Lancaster County. He had set up uh, a business. Uh, he had a motel and he had a gas station and a diner. And he charged top dollar for a hamburger in those days, which was like four dollars. in uh, I think it was like the 1930s and 40s. And people were like, "How are you? why are you charging so much? And it's like, well... I want people who are on their way to New York City and have the money. Well, what they didn't realize is he lit the whole place with a series of batteries in the basement because at that time, the electric company didn't reach out that, that far. So they came to him and they said, well, you know, we'll give you electricity, but you got to plop down 30 grand, which in those days was a lot of money. And he said, go to hell. And so he kept those batteries for probably another... <laughs> 30 years as they started to run lines all over the place. And this is the problem we have that corporations, I believe, could do better at this. They could really put, because they're not looking at the bigger picture. They're looking at the immediate balance sheet instead of, hey, this could be much, much bigger later down the road. Vision, isn't that right? It is. They, it's they, about vision. Vision and social responsibility. Uh, but I think the government has a role, too. The government should be encouraging these people to do that. Uh, yeah. Right now, the way they allow people to uh, have a, a radio channel uh, is uh, they uh, auction it off. The yeah. person with the most money gets the uh, permission to use a certain, uh, the, uh, the radio spectrum. Well, that doesn't make any sense because these people will go for the the, they will cherry pick. They will yeah. get really good service in the cities where lots of people are because they can make more money, which, you know, if you think about it, that's what they should do. But the FCC should figure out ways of getting people to provide service in the rural areas uh, and also to fight, incentivize these big companies to serve segments like education uh, and healthcare yeah. separately from uh, social media and uh, email. Right. They are different services. They ought to have uh, different motivations. Uh, and they all uh, uh, make our lives better. The government ought to encourage all of them. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I have a question for you. Now, you and your wife, Arlene Harris, you've co-founded numerous wireless technology companies and um, this includes cellular business systems, SOS wireless communications, great call, array.com, or arraycom. Um, and you're the chairman of Dyna LLC. And uh, I wanted to ask you a question. What's it like to work with your wife? <laughs> no, you, you have to know, Brad, that I'm very fond of my wife. Good. <laughs> I'm, in fact, I'm mad about her, but uh, she's an inventor. Uh, but she never stops inventing. She's inventing day and night. And wow. she will walk down the street and look at uh, a telephone pole and say, you know, that's ridiculous. Somebody will have to fix that. <laughs> and here's how to fix it. So she wants <laughs> to fix the whole world. And at times, again, it becomes unnerving. Uh, but she's a neat lady. And uh, her track record is uh, quite incredible. She invented... Yeah. The jitterbug phone, which you're, uh, I, I bet a lot of your constituency knows about. Yes. Which is wow. a phone that was designed for uh, seniors. 
uh, that was our, our most successful endeavor because that company is now a part of Best Buy. Right. Uh, but Arlene is fantastic. She, they refer to her as the first lady of wireless. That's incredible. Yeah, you are like the original power couple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not easy all the time. <laughs> oh, I know. You have to be on your toes. Like I said uh, about big companies, you can, you uh, you have to be a little paranoid, but uh, but uh, we've had a great run. Well, the two of you have giant brains, so I, I think you're made for each other because uh, you know not everybody can work together, and you do. And I, uh, I, it's a testament to not only the love you have for her, but I can hear the admiration that you have, and I love when couples. Um, can bring this together and work together. Fantastic. Uh, I wanted to ask you this. You, uh, you were the first to observe the law of spectrum capacity, which has now become known as Cooper's Law, named after you. What is that? Well, uh, it's, it, the, uh, I mentioned before that the Congress uh, is auctioning off radio spectrum. And the okay. principle, if, you, if you're going to get a lot of money for something, uh, it has to be scarce. Right. Well, it turns out that's a myth because uh, we were talking about Tesla back in the Tesla Marconi days. Uh, there were, when, when Marconi commercialized radio, there was one transmitter in the world. So the, and the capacity of that, the ability to, of that, of the, all the radio channels in the world was one bit every six seconds. Wow. So you, you compare that with how we are uh, today, where uh, uh, every human being on Earth, almost everyone, has access to megabits per second uh, at every location on the world. It turns out that the capacity of the spectrum, the ability of the radio waves to carry data, has doubled uh, every 30 months, every wow. two and a half years. I did, I did some measurements. It's gone up and down with time. And when cellular came on, it did a, a peak and then leveled off for a while. But the average over the last 120 years is doubling every 30 months. Well, you don't have to do the arithmetic, which is not real hard. It turns out that's a trillion times increase in capacity since Marconi. How can this be a scarce commodity? Because right. we have technology available to us that's going to keep that going for at least another 50 years. So somehow that myth has got to be broken at some point, but very hard to do when people like Verizon and AT&T have spent billions of dollars to get exclusive use of, of pieces of the spectrum. So that problem is going to get fixed. It's going to take a few generations, yeah. but, uh, but uh, this uh, law which, by the way, is not really a law. It's, it's an observation. Uh, it's held true for 120 years, and I have to tell you, Brad, it's going to hold true for another, you know, maybe indefinitely. I think that's incredible that you observe that because um, you know we're we're in a day and age where you, you look at data and you look at. Um, I remember in the beginning when I bought my first Macintosh computer, you know, and. Uh, the first thing we did is like, we need more RAM. We need more, you know, memory. We, and it was so expensive, like to get 80 meg megs of RAM cards back in the day, it was like $1,600. Now you can trade them and buy them and the price comes down. But I think you're right. It's um, we're creating something much bigger with watching the data. Like, uh, right now, people are looking at uh, memes where you know where people are discussing certain things, and they're watching. They can physically, in a three D environment, you know, on a computer, actually see where discussion is happening about this, or and how it's influencing people to change or to change laws in certain areas. I find this fascinating. This 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 giant global conversation that's happening right now, which is ironic that you have the globe behind you um, on your background. We truly are stepping into the unknown at this point, wouldn't you say? You bet. You're, when, you're, uh, when your granddaughter, uh, two generations from now, does a podcast, the people on this podcast will observe other people as though they were right next to them. They'll yeah. see them in 3D with high fidelity. Uh, and that 
kind of collaboration, the ability of people to work together, uh, and, but in this case, 24 hours a day, wherever they are, they can be next to each other. Uh, the increase in the efficiency that happens when you do that, it will be incredible. And that's why uh, I'm very optimistic. With all the problems we have in the world today, there is the potential that we will be wealthier, uh, healthier, uh, and and uh, more educated succeeding generations. That's fantastic. If you had to predict the future, what could you uh, you tell us right now that you see coming? Well, the, the most incredible thing is uh, what's going on in healthcare now. That that we are getting be, uh, uh, building the skills to be able to look at a person's body and anticipate disease before it happens. Yeah, uh, think of what that means. That that if you are, are being monitored continuously, and I'm talking about your body, not your not your mind. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, as an example, uh, you get some cell divisions that that are cancerous. Right. If you attack that at the beginning, just when it happens, you'll stop it from becoming a disease. You know, all of us have cancer cells, uh, uh, all kinds of bad things in our body, viruses, bacteria, bad bacteria, and our immune system is what keeps us healthy. Right. And if we can anticipate the failure of the immune system and treat it before it happens, we have the potential of conquering disease. Can you imagine having a world where there is no disease? Right. So, so that's one of the potentials. Uh, and uh, I have a strong feeling that our educational system is uh, pretty screwed up at the moment. Uh, and uh, there are lots of things yeah. that can be fixed there. But the whole idea of collaboration uh, is going to make everybody's lives better. I look forward to that future because uh, I've, I've always been a Star Trek fan. So I, I'm hoping we can, uh, I, I can command a starship before I'm too old. <laughs> yeah, well. But uh, when the Star Tech phone came out by Motorola, I had to buy it because it's based on William Shatner flipping it open like that. Um, I just, uh, technology is, um, it's astounding that we got here because I'm, uh, I'm going to be honest, I'm a, I'm a, that end of uh, the boomer generation. I'm a little young boomer. And uh, we grew up with, hey, in the year 2000, technology is going to solve all our problems. We're going to be living in a dome city on the moon. We're going to be flying with jetpacks to work. Uh, we're going to have instant food coming out of a replicator right there. Um, so we were taught this, and I don't think the next generation understands this. There was living proof that it was going to happen because we watched the first man land on the moon and then all our TV shows reflected this, all our toys reflected this, everything. The future is going to be awesome. And now we're here and we realize it's been very hard to climb that mountain and we're getting there, but uh, it's just exciting to talk to somebody like you who not only is a pioneer, but you're, you're still staying on the pulse of what is taking place uh, on planet Earth right now, and you have great solutions. Yeah, well, uh, I'm afraid we have set people's expectations a little high with science fiction. But all of those things that you mentioned are going to happen sooner or later, uh, yeah. assuming, assuming we don't blow each other up. <laughs> which there yeah. is a distinct possibility we could do that. Uh, but we just have to be a little more patient. And that's one of the problems we've got is that uh, people... Uh, have to take a scientific approach. We have to plan things. They don't happen instantaneously. And, and that's true. where we've got a problem uh, with our governments, where the governments are run by uh, politicians uh, and by lawyers. Uh, and there are enough and not enough scientists and engineers to influence government. We need a better balance so that people... Uh, in the government, have a vision of the future, and so we can plan for the future. That's at the true. moment, uh, uh, the, the uh, an ordinary person, and I don't mean ordinary in the sense of, uh, of uh, inferior, but regular people who don't think about the future 
can't anticipate the problems that are coming. And, and uh, the responsibility of government is to protect us from these things, as we're finding out, as people right. in Texas found out, uh, the whole uh, pandemic, uh, 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 there were people protecting the pandemic. We could have been better prepared. They could yes. have been better prepared for the, for the weather change in, in uh, Texas. Yeah. So, uh, the, uh, politicians have to uh, collaborate with the scientists and engineers and anticipate these problems, solve those problems just the way we're going to solve the, the health care problem. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with you, and bravo for saying it. Um, I lived in New York for 35 years, and I got to tell you, it, it drove me crazy because medical decisions were being made by lawyers. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, and I just couldn't believe most of them didn't understand what they were talking about. And uh, I grew up in the medical profession, so I was sort of like, I would ask a simple question and they didn't understand. And I'm just like, you're making decisions for our medical health for the entire state. Uh, yeah. So I agree with you. It's like we are living topsy turvy world, my friend. You know, you know, the, the most amusing thing that if, uh, I've seen politically in the past couple of years is the Congress holding a hearing uh, on the Internet and they interview Mark Zuckerberg about Facebook, and the congressman didn't have the biggest idea what Facebook yeah. was. <laughs> Trying to yeah. ask some questions, it was just it was ludicrous. Well, well, I was being a bad boy. I went on Twitter and I I actually directly texted that congressman and I said, "You do realize cookies aren't made of oatmeal and raisins." <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, and they truly do not understand how the technology works and and why it's important to make sure it's in every household uh because i look at it this way marty um twitter has become the new town square for us to speak up and talk and do all these things and so when a corporation decides to pull the plug they don't realize they've now become the ubiquitous town square that we all talked about for the last 200 years that made America great. You could stand up and speak your mind. And now we have this uh, technological plutocracy that's been growing um, instead of helping. We need more of this altruism, looking at the bigger picture and saying, okay, where's humanity going to be in the next 100 to 1,000 years? Are we going to be collaborating together? Or are we going to be subjugated? Are we going to be living in uh, pov impoverished conditions that the state has decided? Are we going to be able to flex and take our talents and be able to just utilize them for the greater good or for humanity or whatever? This is the concern. We are at a tipping point, uh, a turning point, really, on planet Earth. No, I... Uh... That's the trouble with conversations like this, you know. Uh, uh, the, the ability of people to have different positions to argue with each other is where new ideas come from. Yeah, we're not going to do that very well, uh, Brad, because we keep agreeing with each other about about everything. How dare you? <laughs> but, yeah, right. But we really have to stimulate differences of opinion, uh, and that's a serious problem now. Uh, with this uh, concept of uh, everybody has to be politically correct. Everybody has to be, uh, people should be able to disagree uh, and to express different opinions freely. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's I, true. I don't think uh, uh, that uh, having racist uh, tweets uh, and other extremist uh, uh, public pronouncements are reasonable. But if you have a different opinion, you ought to feel very comfortable expressing it without having people uh, jumping on you. I wholeheartedly agree on that because I'm a creative director and uh, I have found that when I put people in a room from Jamaica, India, uh, Ireland, New York City, and we say, okay, we got to build an international website. My God, the creativity that comes out of that collaboration. I mean, I've seen it a hundred times in my life, in my career, and it's so exciting to watch when when people bring a smart idea i think the key is maybe you can answer this a little bit the key is knowing which idea is going to take off 
because a lot of ideas can get thrown on the board during a brainstorm session or a whiteboarding session, but which one will lead to glory and which one <laughs> needs a little incubation time. <laughs> so maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Well, first of all, let me suggest to you that don't you feel sorry for the people that don't have the thrill of having a new idea like you do <laughs> regularly? That really yeah. is so exciting to me. Even though, even though I know that most of my ideas somebody has thought of before, but the idea that you have thought of expressing something in a different way than our other people do, which is why you wrote a book. Right. right. If you were going to write down stuff that that everybody knew and everybody said the same way, there's no point in it. So. Uh, the whole idea of ideas is uh, is crucial, and that's what uh, is the excitement of my life. But what's the basis of ideas? It is learning. You, you know, ideas are synthesis of information. <laughs> uh, so the second part of, of my life that's crucial is I keep learning all the time. You know, I'm 92 years old. Wow. I still learn something new. Uh, every day, and I'm certain that you do too. You have to keep an open mind yeah. uh, and search out knowledge. Uh, and with that increasing knowledge, new ideas pop up, and that's how we solve problems. Thank you. You have been f fantastic. By the way, you look fantastic for 92. You you must take care of yourself. You must eat well, and you're in love, obviously, with your wife. <laughs> um, so thank you. Marty, thank you so much for being on Awakened Nation. We're going to go into the lightning round. I want everybody to reach out and pick up Marty's book, Cutting the Cord, The Cell Phone Has Transformed Humanity. Uh, I think it, it, you'll enjoy it. And it's also an audio uh, book as well. Fantastic. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions so our listeners get to know you better. And uh, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think ready. We'll find out in a minute. We're on the edge of your seat. What should we know about you that most people don't know about you? Well, uh, you know, if, you, if you're a creative person, you may not necessarily be the most reliable person. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, totally disorganized. Uh, I need help even um, uh, keeping appointments. Um, I, I'm I'm continually cleaning my desk off because it's never uh, uh, uncluttered. So uh, I am very disorganized, uh, and my thinking is uh, disorganized. So uh, it turns out that uh, when I was at Motorola, uh, they tried very hard to make an executive out of me. I ran big divisions, but I never really got into it. I really was not a very good executive. It's hard <laughs> to be both creative. Uh, and super organized at the same time. And there may be there are people that are, but don't, don't look at me and expect organization. You and me, brother. <laughs> I am the exact same way. I have, cl I have piles everywhere. I know it's on each pile, but um, the, you know, I, I make appointments pretty well, but I'm, I'm like you. It's like my brain is always somewhere else doing other things. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic. We have that in common. Um, my second question is, is there anything that makes you angry? Well, of course, there is, uh, it, 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 it's irrationality. Uh, so, you know, as in our <laughs> early conversation, I talked about uh, people looking at their cell phone while they're crossing the streets. You know, that, that's irrational, right? You, yeah. <laughs> they know that you can't trust any drivers and they're doing stupid things like that. But the, uh, the irrational things that really trouble me are uh, racism. Uh, 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 Any time you have uh, people disrespecting uh, other people, uh, uh, those uh, those kinds of things yeah. uh, deeply trouble me. That's a good thing. You should be troubled by those things. Uh, I'm glad uh, that you're angry at that because <laughs> I am too. Um, my third question is, you've had this amazing, tremendous career, um, but what do you really want to be known for when you leave this earth? Oh, I, you know, uh, I hate to be disrespectful of you in this regard, but if I'm not here, I, I really don't uh, care very, very much. Uh, nice. I, uh, I, I'm not going to be around 
And my legacy is people that I've influenced. Uh, I've got a, a wonderful family. Uh, uh, my wife is smarter than I am. I hope my grandchildren are. In fact, I know, I know they are <laughs> smarter than I am. So that's my, uh, my legacy. Uh, and if, uh, if, uh, if people if, if that I knew remember me as being a constructive person that influenced them in a positive way, and that's the most exciting thing that can happen to me. Wow. Thank you, Marty. God bless you. It has been an honor to have you here on Awakened Nation today. Um, thank you. My honor, uh, Brad, you I ask wonderful questions. And, and the only trouble with you is you don't disagree with me enough. But maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll think of something where we could be collaborative and, and more constructive. You see, that is the key to innovation, to moving forward. And that is you got to be able to disagree with each other. Every business partner I've ever had where we were successful, we disagreed. But we had a skill set that overlapped, but we had opposite skills. And that really helped. And that argument, you know what? You know what was the cornerstone of every argument? We, we wanted to have the very best product out there. So we were fighting for being the best. So that's what drove us. We just wanted to be the absolute best. So something to be said for that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Marty Cooper, the father of the cell phone. Thank you so much for being on Awakened Nation. Everybody, please tune in next week for another extraordinary guest here on the show. And uh, thank you. Take care. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you, and see you next week.